Evening, ladies and gentlemen, let's wait for him to turn on. There it is. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is June 18th, the time is 7.30 for the Committee of the Whole. Um, we will be short Alderman Budmats for this evening, but I guess we should just dive right in and bring up Ms. Gallagher, uh, Fiscal Year 2018 Audit. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, City Council. Uh, tonight we proudly present the City's FY 2018 Audit to the City Council. The audit has been released via email only to the City Council and Mayor, and it is marked as draft only. So you will see that atop the cross, the pages in the actual audit. So the electronic version that you received in your emails will say draft. What is before you, what I handed out in the bound copies, is just the management letter that we provide to you with additional information regarding the audit. So the audit is in final form, and we will provide our last review with our city's auditors um, before we go to print, and we go to print before June 28th. Uh, the city will release the final audit by Friday, June 28th, and the audit will be uploaded to the city's website at www.cityrm.org, and a printed copy will be available at City Hall and also the library. There will be limited printed copies uh, for the city, uh, council and mayor, so if you would like one made available to you, just let me know. The audit will be submitted to many organizations and agencies by the end of June. So we submit our audit, uh, mostly electronic, but there are some paper copies still, such as Cook County. <laughs> uh, we also submit to the Standard & Poor's, credit rating agencies, Moody's. Uh, we submit to the Comptroller's Office, the Security and Exchange Commission, IDOT, IEPA, DOI, the Comptroller's Office, and many other granting agencies and State of Illinois agencies. In addition, the city files other items such as grant, accountability, transparency, portal items, and the annual TIF report and others. In tonight's City Council agenda packet, we have the following attachments. We have the FY 2018 Audited Fund Balance Summary, the 2018 un, uh, Audited Fund Balance Review, which is specific to the general fund. We have the 2018 Fund Balance Policy Review, which is the, for the general fund, the refuse fund, and the 911 fund. We also have the 2018 financial results for IMRF, police and fire pensions, and a comparative result back to 2017. And we have the debt service outstanding, which is estimated. And we added the 2019 bonds so that you would have the full look um, with the issuance in 2019. In addition to the city's audit, the city provides a shortened audit called the Citizens Report or the Popular Annual Financial Report. And that does summarize our 200 page audit into about 10 pages with some charts and graphs and easily readable information for our residents and businesses. And this report will be available also by June 27th um, or 28th and loaded onto the city's website. The city's auditors uh, determined that the city's uh, financial statements are accurate and consistent with accounting standards. And the city did receive a clean audit opinion from the auditors, the highest level of audit opinion. The city met its fund balance target for funds that do have fund balance policies, and we'll get into that in a little bit. And then also our city overall, in terms of the solid, has a solid financial position at the end of December 31st, 2018. While we have a lot of information documented in the audit, we try to summarize high level as wherever we can. And as mentioned, we do have the fund balance review, which will give you the high level review in your packet as far as ending fund balance. Uh, our auditor, Jamie Wilkie, will be here in just a second uh, to review a couple of, um, not only a couple of things, but throughout the entire audit. But I wanted to highlight a few things directly from the audit and the transmittal letter. Uh, we have shown revenue strength and diversification in 2018 by kicking off video gaming. We also added ambulance billing enhancements to capture revenue that we previously did not have. We also our, diversified our revenue stream for natural gas tax by modernization. We increased our food and beverage uh, taxes in terms of the overall receipts coming in due to those economic development enhancements. We saw an increase in real estate transfers and building permits as well. Economic development, as far as progress on that front, the comprehensive plan update occurred, and there'll be zoning uh, code update in 2019. The business messenger engaged local businesses, and that's a quarterly update to businesses. We had a business and community showcase, the first uh, one in its kind in this area, restaurants opening and expanding, and restaurant incentive plan and outdoor seating guideline updates. 
There's definitely more uh, community events happening, and that's also documented in our city's audit. Um, in terms of building for the future with capital and projects, uh, also highlighted in the audit, we successfully issued general obligation bonds and maintained the city's credit rating, uh, reaffirmed by Standard & Poor's. Uh, the city's multi-year ERP project is underway, and investments into the city's utility fund infrastructure improvements are occurring as well. The city invested uh, nearly $2 million overall in annual street program, roadway, and other roadway improvements. And the Golf Road, cor corridor, Golf Road Corridor has benefited from many of the roadway improvements through the Golf Road TIF. Those are many <coughs> highlights, just a few of the highlights from the city's audit. I did want to introduce our city's lead auditor, Jamie Wilkie of Lauterbach and Amen. She is going to review the city's audit with the city council. And again, that was emailed to the city council and the mayor, so it's directly in your email when you're going through the audit with Jamie. And Jamie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Good evening. We appreciate you having us out this evening to review the annual audit. I certainly uh, must start this discussion with a huge thank you to the staff here internally. Um, the amount of effort that staff here puts into the annual audit is um, quite honestly not the norm that we typically see in most government engagements. Um, I think their commitment to ensuring that the financial statements that we receive when we come in to do our testing are 100% accurate, all adjustments have been made, and, and really an effort to coordinate with our staff uh, throughout this process, which is really kind of six months from start to finish. So uh, quite a bit of back and forth here with the staff, and I certainly want to thank Melissa and her team for all of their efforts, so thank you. Uh, I know Melissa covered quite a few key items related to the audit. I want to start with just a few high-level items and then we'll walk through kind of front to back uh, the report itself. I'll be able to point out some of the key areas within the audit along with some of the key transactions for the year as we walk through. Uh, the CAFR itself, Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, is really the highest level reporting we can have for a government entity. Uh, that is an external program run through the Government Finance Officers Association. So the comprehensive annual report does have certain required components and we'll kind of walk through those uh, briefly. Uh, but certainly there is a lot of effort as you can see that's put into that document on an annual basis. So again, uh, to thank staff for their efforts in all of those components that have to be pulled in and certainly other departments even within the city itself. Uh, there is definitely feedback required from public safety and public works to get through this kind of six month process. Uh, the city, as uh, Melissa indicated, also produces what we call a popular annual financial report that is run by the same government finance officers association. Uh, that is really a truly condensed version of trying to take this 200 plus page document uh, down to a more palatable, uh, digestible uh, discussion of the city's finances, local economy, um, you know, economic development, etc. So we are in the process of finalizing that report and as Melissa indicated that will be available at the end of the month as well. Uh, the management letter, as she indicated, is the one bound document that is before you. I was not going to spend a lot of time on that document because I'm happy to report there are no new recommendations for this year. Uh, so overall, no new internal control related issues, no new best practices that we've indicated, um, and at this point, no new significant GASB or Governmental Accounting Standard Board changes that are going to have, um, in our mind, significant financial impact on the city's finances. Uh, within there, you will see uh, that we did implement one new standard for this year from GASB that is related to retiree health care costs. It's what we call Other Post-Employment Benefits, or OPEB. Um, I won't go into the nitty-gritty details. I know our actuary is sitting here in the audience as well, and he and I might be able to give you a three-day session on this, which I'm sure none of you want. Um, so at a very high level, um, most governments, um, you know, prior to this standard, really did not report the true uh, full unfunded liability for future retiree health care costs. So the idea is when we have retirees on a health insurance plan, which is required to allow them on the plan if you are an IMRF employer, um, the overall cost to the plan participants as a whole obviously increase when we have retirees on the plan. Uh, typically in government, the majority of the cost of health insurance is you know, borne by the employer, not the employee. So those future 
potential liabilities are really translated to the employer's financial statements. Uh, so the actuary goes through an exercise, and this was the first year we implemented this new statement. Uh, that did result after those estimates were done in about a $5.6 million future non-cash liability for the city. Okay. Uh, we also, as Melissa indicated, had some new state <coughs> mandates. Um, so we love when we have unfunded state mandates from the state of Illinois. Uh, this was a big year for that. We have a new Grant Accountability and Transparency Act that local governments are required to adhere to. Uh, that is basically an online portal that the state of Illinois is dictating uh, as the uh, basically the format in which local agencies have to submit all of their grant-related activities. Uh, there is an impact on the audit opinion. So the state has also mandated for audit firms who provide government audit opinions that we have to, in theory, audit a little bit differently when we have certain thresholds of grant programs. So uh, just know that's also a key change for this fiscal year. What I'd like to do now, if you have the electronic version of the audit and or paper copy there in front of you, what I'd like to do is briefly go through the sections of the document. Um, my page number references will reference the actual page numbers at the bottom of the document, so just FYI. Uh, we have some major sections within the report, so I'll cover those and then we'll stop at a few of the pages and just give some key highlights as well. Starting on page one, we begin the introductory section of the document. Here you will find information such as the list of principal officials, organizational chart, what we call our transmittal letter. Uh, the transmittal letter is prepared by staff here internally. The goal of the transmittal letter is to really highlight, um, in my mind, kind of the non-financial results for the year. The focus here is really on the local economy, uh, major initiatives, internal policies. Uh, so really not focusing on the results of the numbers, but what is all that, the background that we need to know related to the city that helps us assess the financial condition. And you'll also find a copy of the Certificate of Achievement Award provided within the introductory section as well. Again, that will cover pages 1 through 15 of that document. Starting on page 16 through page 18, you will find the independent auditor's report. Melissa indicated it is a clean audit opinion. Uh, we have basically two goals with any government financial audit. Number one is to ensure that the financial statements are materially correct. So are the balances that have been provided to us by city management, are they accurate and, and reflect reality of the transactions for the year? So are they materially correct? And number two, we are required to assess the internal control environment. So can we rely upon the policies and procedures that the city has put in place? Are they being followed? Do we have issues or areas of concern, red flags, etc. cetera. Uh, certainly if there were issues identified during our testing, we would have to bring those forth to City Council this evening. Um, as I alluded to in the management letter, we have no such findings, recommendations, issues to bring forth this evening. Okay. Flipping then to pages 19 to 42, you'll find a section labeled Management's Discussion and Analysis. Uh, from our perspective, this is probably one of the most important sections within the document. Uh, the goal here is really to be the executive summary to the entire report. So you'll find high-level discussions on results for the fiscal year in comparison to prior year. You'll find information on capital asset activity for the year, long-term debt transactions, um, any of those kind of key operating indicators or trends that we're seeing in the financial statements will also be discussed within this section of the document. Um, so I always encourage our councils and boards um, to make sure you read that section in detail, I do think it provides, um, in more of a layman's terms, the overall results for the fiscal year. Flipping to page 43 then, we start the actual financial statements. The first two set of statements, taking you from pages 43 to 46, provide what we call our government-wide financial statements. These two statements, balance sheet and income statement, are required for external audit reporting purposes only, basically on an annual basis. Uh, so most governments traditionally operate on closer to a cash basis. You prepare your budgets typically closer to what we would consider a cash basis approach. Um, and once a year, we are required under auditing standards standards to provide to the users of the financial statements a picture of the city that would reflect what it would look like in theory if it were a business 
running full accrual and accounting for all transactions including capital assets and long-term debt so these are the two schedules where you will see the city's capital assets pulled in on the balance sheet as well as outstanding long-term debt that would be bonded debt our pension obligations, the retiree liability that we just discussed was recently implemented, and we'll give you an overall then net position or equity for the city as of the fiscal year end. So at the very highest level, what is our snapshot? Um, and so if we take a look at that, uh, we did have positive increase in net position overall. Uh, page 46 will indicate that. Once we take into account all of those transactions, equity went up about 3.9 million in total for the city. Okay. More importantly, I wanna focus on the statements that you typically see on a monthly basis, and those begin on page 47 of the document. Page 47 provides our balance sheet for all of the governmental funds for the city. And I just wanna point out a couple of key items within this page. Uh, the general fund in particular is our primary operating fund, so we're always curious what the results are in that fund each fiscal year. Uh, the general fund ended up with total fund balance of just around $11.1 .1 million. We have 1.4 million on page 47 that is set aside for future compensated absences. Those are um, hours that are on the books and accrued for unpaid vacation time predominantly. Um, and the idea would be if an employee were to leave employment with the city, what would we have to pay out as part of the personnel and union agreements um, with regards to accrued uh, predominantly vacation time, okay? So the city has recognized that we have a potential liability for that and already started segregating some of fund balance to be able to meet those future obligations. Obligations. We're left with then about $9.7 million towards the bottom of page 47 of what we call unassigned fund balance, which is really available for future needs um, and really is the primary component of what we analyze as far as the reserve policy that the city has in place. So as of December 31st, 2018, that 9.7 million represents just about 30.9% of expenditures. Your current fund balance policy is a 15 to 30% range. So we're just at the cusp of the high end of the policy that the city has in place. So Melissa alluded to it was a, a positive year, obviously, to be within that that target. Page 59 starts the notes to the financial statements. So any of the detailed disclosures that you might be interested in uh, related to the numbers themselves, you would find starting on page 59. I was not going to go through those in detail because we're gonna hit the very next section um, that will focus on some of the pension obligations as well as the retiree health obligation and I think is a little bit easier of a snapshot to see that picture. Um, but again, the notes begin on page 59. Flipping all the way then to page 118, and I'll give everybody a second here because I know you're scrolling. Page 118 starts the section we call the required supplementary information. And here is where you'll find the start of the specific disclosures for the city's IMRF police and fire pension obligations. Um, so I just briefly wanted to highlight those. I really think Melissa's summary schedule does a nice job of kind of capturing all of these pages in one nice condensed page. So um, it might be easier if you kind of flip to her uh, executive summary that she provided on pensions within that, that document that she briefly reviewed. Uh, but what you will find is the IMRF pension is about 81% funded as of December 31st. Police is roughly 53% funded, and fire is roughly 44% funded. Our December year ends experienced a um, very unique uh, phenomenon with the timeline because if you all remember, the markets absolutely tanked in December. Unfortunately, when the actuary goes through their exercise to calculate the potential future liability and match that liability to the assets that are on the books as of December 31st, we basically had to take into account those investment losses. If you were to redo that picture at this point in time, 
those pension plans would look a little bit different because we would have recouped those investment losses. Um, so just to note that, you know, certainly market volatility, you can definitely see come into play when we look at pension funding um, as of year end and the anomaly of December really being just a poor market return month. Okay. You'll also find disclosures within this section, again, starting on page 118 for the OPEB or retiree health care liability. Again, as I mentioned, that estimated future liability came in just about $5.6 million for the city. And so we've implemented those required disclosures as well as the related transactions um, on the government-wide balance sheet and income statement. You'll also find within that section the start of the budgetary comparison schedules. The general fund is provided. Uh, you will see we had positive operating results for the general fund as you continue through that section of the document. And we have also provided within that section the motor fuel tax results for the fiscal year. Continuing then on to page 132, You'll find the combining and individual budgetary comparison schedules as well for the rest of the city's funds. Um, so those really start what we call our non-major funds. Non-major funds are just smaller in dollar value um, in comparison to our general fund and our MFT fund. And again, you'll find all of the detailed uh, results for the fiscal year in comparison to budget. Again, I want to point out Melissa has provided for you a really nice snapshot of all of the funds and fund balances um, really is probably an easier place to extract that information versus trying to go through each of the individual fund mm -hmm. schedules within this section. Supplemental schedules begin on page 174. They represent uh, all of the future required debt service payments on the city's outstanding bonds as well as any related loans that are on the books as of December 31st. And the very last section of the document starts on page 178. 178 represents the start of our statistical section. Um, one of the things I want to point out, because we've been working with the city for some time, um, just the historical look back at how far the city has come from a financial standpoint. Um, you know, many years ago, we were dealing with multiple funds with deficit position and deficit cash. Um, as of the end of December 31st, 2018, uh, we really just have TIF 2 that is still in a deficit. And typically, at the start of any TIF, we expect it to be in a deficit until those incremental revenues start flowing through. Um, so the turnaround that the city has made over the last five and ten year period is pretty astonishing, quite frankly, and I think you can see that trend um, starting on page 178 as you flip through those schedules. We've basically provided ten years of financial and non-financial uh, historical information where you can start to see those trends kind of jump off of the page within that section. I would be happy to answer any questions, or Melissa or Barry, if you think there's any other key highlights that we're, um, you know, we want to spend a bit more time on. I'd be happy to to certainly do so. Are there any questions from the council, Mr. Mayor? I've got one question, and this might be more for staff, and it's sure. just educating myself. I can sure. play the rookie card for a year. Is that sure. right? Sure. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> um, it just looking at the recommendations that we got tonight, I know there were prior recommendations Correct. and also the new state law where it's the benefits for retirees, that mm -hmm. $5.6 million, I know it's the non-cashless responsibility. Barry or Melissa, I'm just guessing, are we self-funded? From an insurance perspective, because I was looking too, the changes said noted on employee health care. So mm -hmm. I know I know we didn't hire a ton of people, mm -hmm. and I see that 100% of the premiums are covered by the retirees, correct. but it's because we're self-funded. That is correct. Okay. Correct. Yep. Thank you. Additional questions? Seeing none, then I thank you for your time in the presentation. Thank you. We appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you. And then I guess hold on to your hats as we move from uh, fiscal year 2018 <laughs> audits to actuarial discussion on police and fire pensions. Ms. Gallagher, <laughs> I'll let you lead the way with that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so before I turn it over to our city's <coughs> new actuary, Todd Schroeder of Lauterbach and Amon, I would like to make just a few overall remarks. Uh, the police and fire pension plans, just as by way of background, provide retirement, disability, and death benefits for participants. 
it's important to remember that there are three items that go into the annual overall contribution for pension plans for fire and police. We have the uh, employee contributions, which is set at, by state statute, approximately 9% to the overall employee base uh, salary. Investment returns, of course, determined by state statute, and as Jamie mentioned, that point in time measurement, uh, if you could move the marker from J December 31st, it just depends on where the, the investment uh, lands at that time. And then the employee contribution, which is determined annually after the investment returns are received and the actuary runs the calculations for the year. So those three pieces um, make up the a annual contribution to cover retirement benefits. We have a lot of uh, information and data in the actual audit, um, but we're trying to give you a little bit of a high level overview. Uh, the city's police and fire pension funds are governed by state statute, Article 3 for police pension fund and Article 4 for fire pension fund. And state statute stipulates the investments that they're allowed to make. So each fund does have its own separate investment policy, not governed by the city, and has a professional investment consultant. However, despite the separation from the city, it's important to remember the city ultimately holds the risk and liability for the funds. And so we do our best to make sure that we're making our contributions annually per the city's actuarial reports and have done uh, a great job in that in the last several years. It's also important to remember that each board consists of five members on each of the fire pension and police pension boards. They have two active employees, one retiree, and then two members are appointed by the mayor. And while we've made significant progress over the years, um, it's important to remember too that there, the fluctuations in investment returns really flow quite substantially into how the plan looks overall. So what I included in the packet was the 10-year uh, look at an annual investment returns on one slide, and then also in the packet is the funded status for that 10-year time period. As you can see, the, in, the fluctuation for investment returns over time but then what we've done over time is maintained our level of uh, funded status about 50%. Recall there was some pension reform back in 2011 by which the General Assembly created Tier 2. And those Tier 2 benefits, the city's not going to see realize those types of savings until we see Tier 2 start to retire. So we're sort of in this situation right now, we're trying to make sure we're making our actuarial contributions every single year, but also looking at other ways to chip away at that unfunded liability. As we've discussed before, more pension reform needs to take place in the part of the state of Illinois. Uh, local voices, of course, need to be heard overall. The city has maintained its credit rating from Standard & Poor's and Moody's, and really their reasoning was the action that the city has taken over the last several years. If you recall, uh, back in 2017, uh, the city provided additional contributions from reserves for the pension funds, and we've been also funding our plans at a shortened amortization period. And just like a mortgage, the, the more that you can pay down towards principal over time is where we're trying to achieve. And for there were some time back where we were making sort of interest-only payments, and Todd will get into that in just a little bit. So the city um, has received credentials, of course, from Standard & Poor's because we've had that action plan, and we're trying to look at that overall to see what we can do going forward to include more reserves for the unfunded liabilities. So the city's actuary is going to be reviewing uh, actuarial items that go into producing the property tax levy. So there are two parts that our actuary provides. The actuary provides uh, our audited information that goes directly into our audit for an actuary report. And then there's the tax levy preparation. Two reports, roughly around 200 pages each, or in total, <laughs> if you think of it that way. And a lot of that data then is used for a property tax levy. And that's what we're gonna get into in a little bit here. Again, our overall plan is to achieve a sound funding plan. And one of the things that we've been looking at is how do we achieve that? We're at that marker right now, about a 14-year amortization, or when you think about a home mortgage, 14 years out from, from that. And so our contributions are going to continue to increase. So we need to think about a, a sound actuarial funding plan each year and sustainability over time. So I'm going to turn over to Todd Schroeder, our new actuary, and he's going to discuss a little bit more in depth in turn the new uh, thought process behind a 15-year layered amortization and some other ideas. Todd? And 
Can everybody hear me okay? Mm. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Melissa. Again, my name is Todd Schroeder. I'm the actuary for the pension funds. Uh, what I'll do is I'll give you a high-level overview of kind of where we're sitting this, this year and why, and talk about some of our funding strategies as we, as we progress forward, uh, as Melissa mentioned. Uh, there's two reports that we do for each pension fund uh, each year. Uh, one report, uh, as Melissa mentioned, goes into the uh, audit and is part of the financial statement reporting. That's the GASB reports or Gover Government Accounting Standards Board uh, reports. Uh, so I'm not going to focus on those too much th this evening. But again, those numbers are part of your audit and, and part of all that information. There's a second report we do for each pension fund that's related to the cash funding and the budgeting and the tax levy process uh, and everything like that. So we're going to focus on that part of the conversation because there were some changes uh, that came through this year. Uh, we're looking between the two funds right now of about uh, an increase of about 1.1 million dollars uh, in contribution uh, from last year's uh, calculation to this year's calculation um, and putting you right around eight million dollars uh, in total between the two funds just under the eight million dollar mark uh, between the two funds uh, there's a couple things with your actuary there's a couple things we do that's the most uh, i'll call it the most pure actuarial part of the process um, it's, it's a it's really a two-step process step one uh, is estimating what the pension funds are going to be paying out in the future so that's where we use the actuarial assumption side of the process it tells us uh, our assumptions tell us when people are going to retire and start receiving benefit payments when we think they're going to stop receiving benefit payments what are the chances there's a beneficiary involved that will receive benefit payments so step one of the process is really estimating those future benefit payments uh, as far as your results this year that's where we saw the most change uh, in, in the results this year is in that step one of the process estimating the future benefit payments uh, what we do for you and what we do for all our pension funds is on an every every three to five years we do a full scale review of Illinois police and fire pension funds uh, to give us a good idea on things like when our folks retiring how often are we seeing disabilities within the pension funds uh, how long are folks living and receiving payments from these pension funds uh, so that we can keep you as current as possible uh, as part of that process one of the new pieces uh, that we added this year uh, not only was bringing you current uh, related to, and this is related to your mortality assumption, uh, but we're also now estimating how mortality is going to improve going forward in this process. Since we're trying to estimate benefit payments 10 years from now or 20 years from now, as part of this process, it's important for us to understand what we think the life expectancy environment is going to look like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, all the way out to potentially 80 years from now for your, you know, your active members who are accruing their service right now and will be receiving payments from the pension fund uh, as part of this process. So one of the key changes uh, that was a driver to these results is we are now not only bringing you current on mortality which is a process you've already been through uh, before this year uh, but we're now projecting that uh, into the future uh, as well and what that's going to help with uh, it's going to help us uh, increase some of the stability related to mortality changes as new as new information comes out uh, in the future and help you manage the volatility uh, related to those changes on a going forward basis as part of this process. So again, step one of the process is where we saw a lot of the change uh, with respect to the contribution. Step two of the process then is how do we want to pay for those contributions. Uh, as Melissa mentioned, you're on a 14-year payoff schedule, uh, so a 2033 payoff. Uh, of the unfunded liability uh, as part of the process uh, and in your current results we didn't make any changes uh, to your funding policy uh, overall your funding policy uh, for this year's results is in a is in a very good spot uh, if you look at the actuarial literature on best practices and funding policies uh, you fall within those parameters uh, the government finance officers association uh, also has literature out there on funding policy uh, they have a best practices work paper and you fall uh, within those parameters as well uh, and as Melissa mentioned uh, S&P standard and pours a rating from a rating agency perspective uh, also likes the funding policy so you kind of got everybody on the same page with respect to your funding policy and you're doing a, a good job with the with the city's funding policy where it stands right now so in, in terms of where you're at right now and, and the overall 
uh, fiscal responsibility, we didn't make any changes for this year's uh, contribution. Uh, the one piece of funding policy that we'll be talking about as the year progresses and not really related to this year's contribution, uh, but to future contributions, uh, is the sustainability of that uh, policy. So that policy gave you the results uh, you saw this year uh, in terms of the contribution. Uh, again, approximately $8 million uh, in contributions. Uh, we want to come back with, as we uh, look towards future years, and, and we'll work with, uh, work with staff on getting you some information on that, uh, is what does this funding policy potentially look like in 2025, 2030, as you start approaching that 2033 mark to see um, what the sustainability looks like uh, going forward. The 100% payoff by 2033 works out as long as we can make our contributions all the way through 2033 in that process. So I think it's important for you to see that information uh, as well. Again, it doesn't affect this year's numbers and we wouldn't make any changes to this year's numbers, um, but it does affect things uh, going forward. Uh, we've got a couple ideas related to volatility management and things like that, and that becomes more important as your uh, payoff period gets shorter and shorter. Uh, you do run the risk if your payoff period gets down to, let's say, five years, uh, and the markets have a return uh, like they did last year, uh, for example, it doesn't give you a lot of time to react to that uh, and to pay for those changes. And good funding policy doesn't necessarily require you to pay for those changes on such a short period of time. Uh, so we've got some um, some information that we're going to provide related to kind of layering out and separating out your unfunded liability, recognizing what you have today that you want to take care of over 14 years, and then when new things come up in the future, uh, we'll talk about how we want to handle those things and, and talk about them independent of what we're doing with uh, today's unfunded liability. What that should do for you is allow you to continue to improve your funded percentage uh, that you have today related to your uh, current unfunded liability and appropriately react, react to any future uh, changes that come up. Uh, currently, from a funding policy uh, perspective, uh, if you look back at the last five years, you've had a couple big factors uh, working against you and you have been able to uh, at least maintain or tread water uh, as part of this process uh, of funding in terms of the metrics uh, people most commonly look at, funded percentage uh, and things like that. Um, again, the city's policy, uh, which is which is backed by a lot of different organizations uh, in terms of the health of the policy, is a is a sound policy. What it's done, um, and Melissa brought up the mortgage example. You're kind of far enough along in your mortgage, and you've gotten that period short enough where your payments are greater than your interest on your unfunded liability now. Meaning each year you make a payment, uh, we're expecting that to chip off and chip down the unfunded liability. Uh, as part of this process. Uh, so you've been, you've been in that situation for the last four to five years, so um, that's put you in a good spot. Um, you made additional contributions as well uh, in the last five years, so that's been a positive uh, in terms of your uh, funded percentage uh, and your progress on your funded percentage. Uh, the two items that worked against you that kind of kept you at that tread water spot in terms of your funded percentage. Uh, one was the markets uh, over the last five years. Um, and, and you know, markets, you like to get your returns obviously over a long period of time, but you're, you're funding for this and reacting to uh, things that happen over a shorter period of time. Uh, in the last five years, we've had relative to the expected uh, returns on the assets, you had two years that are pretty, pretty normal. You've had one year that was good, 2017 was a, a good year uh, for the markets in general. And then you had two years that were uh, less than expectation, um, 2018 being the most recent example of that, uh, just this past year uh, that ended. Uh, so you've had a little more on the downside than you've had on the upside, uh, which has held your assets down a little bit, which brings your funded percentage uh, back down. Uh, the other thing you've had in the last five years is a remeasurement of the liability and that was a lot of the process of bringing your uh, mortality current and there was some new information that came out in 2014 related to mortality and they're, they're releasing information on a fairly regular basis now um, but some of that has brought your liabilities up uh, in the past five years so again that's that's worked against your funded percentage so the city's policies the additional contributions have have allowed the city to at least tread water through a couple of tough things that have hit your assets and liabilities uh, both in the opposite direction that you would like to see uh, on a regular basis so again some of the metrics we've put in this year is going to help you manage uh, some of that uh, on a going forward basis uh, as part of this process um, in terms of 
in terms of the assumptions, funding policy approach, are there any, any questions uh, on the process? No questions. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Moving forward then, we'll go ahead and continue with the general fund distribution of some reserve monies. Back to our pensions. Ms. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, for this discussion, we've got um, in your packet uh, a couple things here. So um, as we finish up our audit, as in years past, we will bring back a discussion to the City Council uh, for your input and approval to look at our fund balance level. And as we just went through our discussion of the audit, uh, with our cash balances and our fund balances, uh, we are re recommending a reallocation of fund balance. And if approved at the tonight's city uh, committee of the whole meeting, we would bring forth a budget amendment uh, resolution to be drafted um, and bring it forth to a, a future city council meeting. Um, when we were discussing, just as uh, Todd was reviewing all of the information as well as Jamie, uh, the, the city's total outstanding pension liability is something we're keeping a very close eye on. And while we're still, as Todd mentioned, uh, treading uh, at about 50%, we need to look at the long-term viability and making additional contributions from reserves are one of those ways. Um, with the fact that IMRF also is about 80% uh, funded. Uh, one of those things when the market goes in a different direction, we need to be keeping an eye on the overall liabilities. So as we've discussed in the past um, during the budget process and during other discussions, after the audit is completed, we typically will come back to City Council for uh, thoughts and ideas as far as an approval to move forward with um, an reallocation of fund balance. And so the city's unfund unassigned general fund balance is about 9.7 million, which is 30.9% of expenditures to fund balance for the fiscal year 2018. And the general funds fund balance policy is a range, as we know, from 15% to 30% of expenses to fund balance. In your in your council packet, we have an attachment that goes into detail, but I'm going to review that with you. The proposal is to move uh, funds from the general fund and reallocate. And there's a chart that goes into that, and it's pretty self-explanatory, but I'll walk you through it as well. So currently with our 30.9, we're recommending a reserve level to drop down to 26.1 or $8.1 .1 million, which is approximately three months reserves. And the use of fund balance would be approximately 1.5 million. And the thought process is, given the fact that we've got about a $1 million contribution additional that we have to make for the pension funds for the 2020 proposed budget, to start that reserve process now with a $400,000 $400, 2019 property tax levy amount from reserves from 2018. So what we're doing is we would be taking $400,000 from reserves for 2018 and allocating it for the 2020 budget, for um, particularly for the property tax levy. Then moving through the chart itself, we have a $500,000 additional contribution for the police pension fund and also a $500,000 contribution for the, the fire pension fund and a $100,000 additional contribution for the IMRF uh, pension fund, Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund. Those payments, the proposal would be for, to be made in 2019. So it's two parts when you think about it. 2019 would be the additional contributions for the pension funds. And for 2020, what we're trying to do is bring down the property tax levy for that with the $400,000. So the use of reserves in conjunction with this longer range plan is to overall reduce the property tax levy for 2020 budget and kind of just so you know in the next agenda item there is the property tax uh, levy proposal or working tax levy. But what we wanted to do was bring this back to city council and go through that as far as a discussion. And then what we would do, as we've done in the past, is through a budget amendment, uh, come back to City Council with a resolution. Manager Kromstock. Thank you, Mayor Gallo. Thank you for letting me talk too much either. But um, 
I just want to make a few other comments that when uh, Melissa and I were going through this, obviously aldermen who have been on the uh, board in the past, when we bring this back, typically we put a lot into local roads and some additional <coughs> capital items. Obviously with the sale of the bonds and with some other money that we've done in the past to capital improvement, we thought it's very important that we need to start addressing that $211 million liability. We thought it, this was proactive on a two-stage front, meaning 2019 money into about $1.1 million and then the other $400,000 into the 2020 budget for the uh, property tax levy. So it has a little different feel from what we've done in the past, but we're also staying within our parameters. Um, the whole discussion that we've had in the past about where is our comfort level between that 15 and 30 percent is still three months of reserves. You still don't know what's going to happen in the economy. You don't know what's happening with the state of Illinois. Yes, they do have a budget. There was a period <laughs> of time that they didn't have a budget for two years. So we feel comfortable looking out longer, and that's why we are making this recommendation. It is a little bit different from what we've done in the past. But we believe with what the budget amendment that we did before, putting more into local roads already, plus some of the other pieces that we see, this is why we came up with this decision for the $1.5 million of reallocation. And just briefly remind me how you came to that sum of the $400,000 again. So when we do the calculation, and this will be actually a little more apparent in the next discussion on the budget parameters, the $400,000, and again, I'm sort of jumping. Um, That's okay. It's on electronic page 18, the tax levy scenario. I know you're probably jumping to that if I'm correct there, so you can see that. I don't have electronic copies. So. I marked it down because I knew we would be flipping back and forth. <laughs> so when you look at that um, draft tax levy that we talk about, this is following some of the parameters that we've had with the 2019 budget and even with the discussion about the bonds. But when you look in that third to last bottom in the main subject, that's where the use of the general fund for $400,000, reducing that overall, if you just continued with everything, with what the actuarial is stating right now with when we talked about that additional 1.1 plus some of the other pieces that we talked about, it was a 7.1. So that 400,000 plus the additional 276 brings it down to a 2.4, which is what we've always talked about with the council that we were using as a target for the 2020 budget. Mr. Grumstadt, can you, can you uh, describe which column you're in again for that? I'm actually in the dollars change from levy 2018. Okay. Um, if you look in the main body of that part, it would be where the yellow proposed property tax levy mm -hmm. go two levels before that, and that's the $400,000 that we're utilizing, plus the other um, less part that we're using for some reserve amount to make that 2.4. I know it's a little complicated for people at home, but... Um, following the sheets, that's why we came up with that 400000 plus addressing the liabilities with a half a million, half a million, and the $100,000 to IMRF. Okay. Any additional questions from the council at this time? Alderman Cannon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Barry or Melissa, maybe one of you guys can answer this question for me. You know, looking at the returns from last year, you know, realizing that anybody who follows the market knows December was a bad year or bad month. But when we see what happened with IMRF, I mean, that's incredible. They were down 13%. I mean, the market wasn't down 13% last year. So are they, have they changed their philosophy on how they go to market, what they're, how they're investing their money? Do you, would you be aware of that? It, it really was part of... Mar part of the market, so no, we'll think about that. It, yeah. But then there were some other pieces to that, as far as the actuarial as well. So there were some actuarial changes as well. Oh, okay. So it's so not part just, of it. it's not just the investment return, then. right? But IMRF has not changed their philosophy and their changes. It just was some of the components that were put into it. Okay. And I guess one of the things I would ask you just to reiterate, especially for the new members of the council, and they might be very well aware of it, but remind people that we have no influence on how the money in fire is invested. Mm -hmm. That is and, correct. But yet we're still responsible for the outcome. Yes, that is correct. So, again, going back to what has been stated by uh, Jamie Wilkin and Tom Schroeder, but um, 
for the city of Rolling Meadows, the main three pensions that we have are specifically police and fire. Those are two separate ones. Their own separate boards, five member board as have been discussed, two active members, one retiree, and then two members that the mayor and the city council approve of. Obviously, finance director Melissa Gallagher sits on those two. Um, you will not see managers sit on those because we're usually the ones who say no, but that's a different story. So that five member boards run those two. I am a ref, which is for all non-sworn officers, police and fire. Um, that's I am a ref, and that's for any municipality plus um, like janitors at schools and some other um, places. That is one board for all of us. So they accumulate millions and play with billions in investments compared to each of these numerous um, pension boards that are throughout the state of Illinois that they they're, have their own autonomy as they make their investments per state rules and some of the other pieces. If I can make one little pitch, and I'm a little off your subject, and I hope that the mayor doesn't let me down on this, this is why mayors, managers, city councils have been lobbying so hard down in Springfield to bring economies of scale and also change pensions overall because where you have IMRF that is doing so well, and then when you have so many different pension boards that do fluctuations, some are high over here, some are down over here, they change different pieces, that's why we're trying to get this really under control. And I know that the press always talks about Springfield having certain pension problems. This is a big nut, if you want to call it, that we've always had. And every time Springfield changes a benefit or they change something else, it, that's why we lobby so hard. And that's why when you see, when we make comments from the Northwest Municipal Conference or IML, why it is a major subject, this is a big item. And that's why a majority of property taxes go up because of the actual changes. And one other comment just for the new members, and I know that you've heard this before, for a period of time, the police and fire pensions were very consistent. Mortality rates didn't change, their benefits didn't change, and then change, change. Mortality rate, after not being really touched for roughly 30 years, no comment back there, all of a sudden they made a big change, and then they changed it again. So you're trying to keep up with some of those other pieces. So going back to your question, that's why we have three that are in place. One does very well because it's for everybody and anybody. And then these autonomous, if you want to call that, groups, we're doing our funding and reiterating their three sources. Our property tax is one, what they pay in it, and their investments are really the three that are going into that. So that calculation that we're talking about, $211 million, that's why we're using this kind of flow of pay some now, pay some later, but we're trying to continue with that contribution. And I would love to say December 31st, we don't have these ebb and flows, and we have these great pieces. And I know for um, Alderman and um, Mayor Gallo, when you sit with us with our one-on-ones, we show you some of those returns, and we go through some of those um, pieces. And I would love to say that the calculations that are in pension boards, about 7% returns, you know, you look at our 10-year return, it's not good. But that five-year return is close, and that's the problem. We're close. So did you make, did, this, did the, um, either the House or the Senate even take a really close look at combining all of them? They are. So um, here's another pitch. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but with IML and Northwest Municipal Conference, they really lobbied very hard. And if you look at the original... Um, they had multiple different plans um, that were being addressed and talked about. But at the end of the day, the House and Senate did not pass any pension reform overall and consolidation. But there's really three that are really getting some traction, but they don't have the votes yet. And that traction um, deals with some of the thoughts of consolidating. Some of that also deals with how the boards are actually set up. The biggest thing is that there's... Um, a feel, and I would be that vague, um, 
that certain people don't want to lose their autonomous feel of that instead of doing the good for overall everything. And then there's some economy of scales because certain municipalities do better, some are worse. Um, you know, we have one municipality that every so often is in the newspapers that their um, pension board is suing to get money. So, thanks. Alderman O'Brien. No, that actually right. took care of the question. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Are there any additional questions from the council at this time? And if not, would you like to see a straw vote this evening? Is that what you're looking for, Ms. Yes, Mr. Mayor, we were looking for a straw vote so that we could bring forth a resolution to a future, future city council meeting. Okay. So then I'd like to see a quick show of hands from the city council to allow for uh, an additional $400,000 to be utilized in the fiscal year 2020 budget. Those who would be in favor, show of hands. Good. Four. Those opposed? One. At this time, the majority does rule, and so it will be brought forth on a future council meeting. Anything more on that subject? No, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Don't go too far. <laughs> we have the next item then, which is going to be the budget parameters for fiscal year 2020. Ms. Yes, Gallagher. thank you. Uh, we, as in past years, uh, provide budget parameters. So the budget planning process is really an annual process, kind of like the audit process. <laughs> we, we continually complete audit, budget, capital planning. It's what we do, uh, amongst other main, uh, major duties in, in finance. But basically, um, in your packet tonight, we've got uh, our budget planning calendar. And then we have our debt service outstanding, which includes the 2018 and 2019 bonds, as mentioned in another uh, council action summary as well. And as we've discussed before, this, um, as in past parameters discussions, really begins the process of reviewing, reviewing the basic parameters for developing the 2020 budget, similar to the past years. Um, we have developed certain items so far. Uh, we continue to look at our overall pieces in terms of chargebacks, and co which are cost allocations amongst funds to make sure our internal service funds are, are operating appropriately. And then, of course, when the audit is finished, that's when we're also looking at where we landed for the year for 2018 and then start to do our perform our estimates for 2019 and begin our 2020 process. So it's important to note that we're monitoring, as uh, Mr. Crumstock, our city manager, has mentioned, in terms of legislation and changes to pension funding. But amongst that, too, all of the other kinds of legislation that m might potentially affect the city. Um, there are many unfunded mandates out there. There are things that, that could affect the local distributed um, fund in terms of motor fuel, per personal property really replacement tax, use tax, all those kinds of things we monitor all the time. We're also looking to be strategically aligned with any new developments that are coming through the, from the state of Illinois. And again, just reviewing as we go along those items to make sure that we're sound uh, at a sound starting point for 2020. We developed two key planning uh, documents to guide the city's decision process in allocating revenues and expenditures. The fiscal year budget is the annual budget and it is the city's financial planning document. And it really does communicate the revenues and expenditures for that one year, but we are also looking ahead, uh, not just at that one year. And in our look to the one year, uh, we also plan for the capital improvement plan, which is the five-year capital improvements plan, which also does have a forecast out five years. And the CIP, as we call it, our capital improvement plan, is reviewed by our ad hoc capital improvements committee. They are currently reviewing those projects right now, and we're having internal discussions. So that capital improvement plan will be presented to the city council at the August 20th committee, the whole meeting, and our proposed budget will be presented to the City Council at our September 10th City Council meeting. What we wanted to do tonight is recognize um, some of the things that we've done in the past, which um, as we've done with our CAFR and also our Citizen Award or Citizen Audit, we since uh, the city since 2016 has received um, and applied or applied for and received the Government Finance Officers Association Distinguished Budget Award. Um, it is a significant achievement for the, the city um, and it's something that we're very proud of. Um, we put that into this write-up as well. 
continuing the focus uh, on several areas that were developed for the 2019 budget. And these are really just headers for the, the planning process, but really not limited to, but headers in your packet. We have headers of um, capital and technology infrastructure projects. That work continues. Public safety and fire protection, economic and business development, zoning and land use planning, if we think of the comp plan and the zoning uh, code update. Community events as also not only a community event uh, development for our area, but then also it's an economic development planning tool. Utility rate stabilization, fiscal stability, and pension funding as we've discussed and reserves. We're looking at the total picture. With the, the general fund, it is the largest operating fund. It accounts for about 60% of the city's operating expenditures and revenues. So it really is that primary focus when we look at things uh, in planning. We also look at our other funds, which are listed in the write-up as well. And when we start the process, although, like I said, we don't really start, we're always working on it, but we do assess our baseline data, and then we look back three to five years in terms of revenues, when we think about revenues. We are also looking at any kind of unfunded mandates, as we just discussed, and anything along the way that we've learned. Um, we're also looking at CPI adjustments, any data from Illinois Municipal League, that's a very important um, forecaster for us, and then our own internal projections, what we know about the community at large in terms of building permits, business licenses, and any kinds of fees that we're looking to readjust. If you think about ambulance fees last year. Um, anything that we can do to adjust and make sure that we're looking at it appropriately. Each fund, for those new to the council, I just want to make sure everyone is aware too, each fund is its, its own unique revenue structure. And some revenues, such as motor fuel tax, have restrictions on the use of those funds. For example, for motor fuel tax, those are approved from IDOT or the Illinois Department of Transportation and can only be used on certain expenditures um, approved by IDOT. When we start to look at the available fund balance from the city's audit, that's also where we look at our fund balance policies. Um, one of the things we're very proud of as a city, I, th I think it's important to recognize that we have a fund balance policy for our general fund, our 911 fund, and our refuse fund. And that's something that we're going to continue to look at and bring back to city council. What other funds can we can we come up with as far as a draft policy? Garage fund is one that comes to mind as an example. Uh, so that we're maintaining a fund balance policy and have those structures in place. The city did approve, the city council approved the utility rate study prepared by Baxter and Woodman. And again, for 2020, the proposal would be no rate increases for the utilities fund. And that was also as an augment to that was the bond proceeds for 2019 that helped the utilities fund. In our budget process, we always look at the refuse rate uh, for the fund balance policy uh, for the refuse fund. And uh, as in past uh, discussions, some discussions have been in the past in terms of residential chipper service. If so, would the council would want a slight increase or look at the fund balance policy to that end. I mentioned chargebacks or the cost allocations between funds. That's something we also take a look at. And we're also incrementally changing those or updating those over time to make sure that our funds are stable internally, which are internal service funds, if you think is like our garage fund or motor pool. As we talked about with the property tax levy, and I believe at page 18, electronic page 18, we'll get into that in just a moment. But the property tax levy, uh, when you think about it, um, encompasses pretty much all of the services that we provide. Majority of it goes into the general fund. And so we have a chart in your write-up. Um, means about 16 cents for each property tax dollar goes back to the city. Majority of that is pension funded, but we also fund police fire protection and also the road program in our debt service. So we provided a snapshot of the, um, just from one township, we do have three in the city. So just to, to look at that, and as a side note, you can also access on our city's website if you ever wanted to dig in a little bit per your address. Um, but it, right now, uh, in your package, you've got uh, the breakdown. As we talked about for the working scenario, and just from a straw vote pro approval, when we look at this page 18 draft snapshot, and we can get back to this in just a moment, 
as Barry mentioned in this, uh, as our city manager mentioned, in this working scenario for the draft tax levy, we have three columns in terms of the 2017 tax levy, the 2018 tax levy, and the 2019 tax levy. It gives you a two-year look back plus the proposed tax levy and then the dollar change so that you can see the changes year over year plus a percent change. When we're looking at the bottom line in terms of the total city change in dollars, it's a roughly about a million dollars or 7% tax levy increase. With that use of general fund reserves from the 2018 budget and the amount that we reserved through the budget process, if you were if you remember and recall that through the 2019 budget process, we reserved an amount of 1.2 million for the debt service payment to be made for 2018. And the remainder of that then would go towards the levy as discussed in the 2019 budget, that 276,000 would be combined to lower the tax levy from a million dollars to 350,000 thereabouts, or a 2.4% increase over year over year. Again, this is a working draft scenario and it's just something that we wanted to, because it's such a focal point for the general fund, we wanted to bring this back tonight for feedback. Before we touch base back to that, I wanted to move on to expenditures, sure. just as, as we're talking about budget parameters. Again, similar to revenues, we, we assess the baseline data. We have union contracts, which really would account for the majority of our expenditures in our general fund. So we, those are known expenditures, and those are, those are calculated per union negotiated agreements. We look at our CPI, our consumer price index data. We also look at all of our pension funds and the requirements to fund per the funding policies that are set up. We look and evaluate and prioritize through the ad hoc capital improvement committee process, all the capital improvements. And then also through the vehicle replacement committee process, we are also looking at and prioritizing all of the vehicles that are in the fleet. As it's known, we, we have an enterprise resource planning software upgrade and development right now, uh, which is an important infrastructure component for our, so our city software to update the outdated platforms. That's a multi-year project. Um, a couple of other keynotes in your um, packet and write-up. Uh, we also look at all our road projects overall. We're continuing the repayment of the $100,000 fifth year of the repayment from the general fund to the vehicle and re replacement fund. Remember and recall it was an interfund loan that is being repaid. It also comes up in credit rating reviews and, and, and uh, our audits as well. And as mentioned before, uh, we are also looking at our road projects too. So that in a nutshell covers sort of the basic high level overview of revenues and expenditures in the beginning parameters that we set forth in the budget planning process. Uh, we would like to turn it over to city council to review not only the working tax levy, but any other considerations for 2020. Are there any questions or comments at this time from council members? Seeing none, then we will move on to discussing uh, with the straw poll. Uh, Ms. Gallagher, how would you like to phrase this question or request from City Council to get approval to move forward? Well, uh, I think similar to the last straw poll is uh, we've got the working draft scenario. If that's something we can move forward with the uh, show of hands for that end. Okay. So then with a quick show of hands, could I see whether or not the Council is in approval of proceeding as as laid out here with the working scenario for fiscal year 2020 proposed budget. All those in favor at this time? That's for current, those opposed? That's one in opposition. So at this point, the majority is in favor of moving forward as proposed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Gallagher, you get a break now. Congratulations. <laughs> Uh, Barry, I'll let you pave the way on the elected officials training and then turn it over to uh, Attorney Jim McCall. So obviously last uh, committee of the whole meeting we did uh, elected officials part one. That was pretty in-depth. We still have some other items that we want to do, um, obviously mention. Obviously uh, City Attorney Jim McCall will take the mic. Um, it will be much quicker than 40 minutes this time. Um, but we also want people to remember that um, if you have additional questions, concerns, please reach out to City Attorney Jim McCall. I hope everybody's done with their reading. Um, there is a test later on the IML book. I know that uh, 
Um, Alderman O'Brien is done with the book because he has actually talked to me about a few parts. Um, I do want to remind, and uh, City Attorney Jim McCall will actually mention this too, that the last meeting we did mention um, for the Open Meetings Act um, training, we do still need your certificates for those who have not turned that in. Um, and there is a requirement on that. If you think that you've done it in the past, you can always go on there and see if you have and then print it out. Um, if you do get the uh, certificates, please send it to myself or Deputy City Clerk Judy Bros over there too. But with that, I do turn it over to uh, City Attorney Jim McCall, who has a better voice than I do. <laughs> Thank you. The, uh, this is going to be a lot brief, uh, briefer than the last time I saw City Manager uh, Crumstock mentioned. The one thing I will point out is I didn't have any distributions or uh, booklets to distribute tonight, although that was a lack of communication on my part between myself and the, uh, and the clerk. Um, just a couple of things. The first thing, which relates to another subject we're going to talk about tonight, are referenda questions. There are two types of referenda questions. There are binding and advisory. Sometimes a council will pass an ordinance or a resolution um, to, to put a question on uh, a ballot to get feedback from the voters as to whether they're in favor of this or that or not in favor but uh, those are largely advisory. The council can still do whatever the council chooses to do. The second type of referendum questions are binding refer referendum questions. Those consist primarily of, uh, of, of uh, resolutions which uh, result in a proposal to change the form of government. A couple months ago, the city council, for example, passed a resolution to propose reducing the consecutive number of an alderman's terms from two, from three to two. That'll be on the March 2020 ballot and, and the voters can weigh in on whether they want to do that or not. Binding referendums such as the one I just talked about are what's called self-executing. In other words, um, if, if more people vote in favor of the referendum than, than not, then with that vote, that referendum goes into effect. Historically, what the council has done on similar th situations, such as term limits, is they've codified the code of ordinances to reflect the uh, that ordinance, uh, or that referendum, rather. Um, but that's not necessary, and that's really not required. There cannot be a condition attached to a binding referendum that the council actually, in this sense, codifies that, uh, that vote. The other thing I wanted to just talk about briefly is the uh, Gift Ban Act. Um, the Gift Ban Act provides that um, you cannot accept uh, a, a, a gift within certain dollar amounts or any gift from a prohibited source. The Act defines a prohibited source as anyone seeking official action by yourselves or an employee or officer uh, of an employee directing the employee or they do business with the, uh, with the city or the officer or an employee in other words, they're, they're a vendor of the city, so to speak, or potential vendor of the city. There are exceptions to that. Um, the, the exceptions consist of if it's a, a, a gift or a, a sum that's available to the public generally, um, that's certainly acceptable, um, or anything that uh, you or a family member or someone in the media family who resides with you because they're also prohibited from accepting those gifts. Um, um, but you pay actual fair market value for. Also, political donations aren't subject to the Gift Ban Act. Um, a gift from a relative uh, is not subject to the Gift Ban Act. Or if you have a personal relationship with someone who does business with the city that you've, for example, known for a long time, and it's your birthday, and they want to take you out for dinner, that's fine. Is so provided that, in your own minds, that's a gift from a close personal friend and not somebody who's trying to gain some advantage uh, doing business with the city. The thing that comes up more often is uh, one of the exceptions is food or refreshments not exceeding $75 in, in one day uh, from a, a prohibited source. As long as you don't exceed the $75 per day, you're okay. The other thing is uh, inter and intra-governmental gifts. 
if, for example, one of your children is getting married and you invite other members of the city council to attend that wedding and that reception and they reciprocate by providing your uh, child and their spouse with a gift, that's fine. That's an exception as well. Um, the other thing is, uh, from any one prohibited source, the value of any gift cannot exceed $100 during any one calendar year. There's also a get out of jail free card if you think that you have violated the act. That is that you immediately return the value of what you received, or if that's not possible for some reason, the alternative that you have is to make a donation for of an, of an amount equal to what you received to a 501c3 charity. So uh, that's, uh, that's a possibility as well. The other thing is land use and zoning. A couple of years ago, the city combined the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning and Zoning Commissions. Um, the function of the Planning and Zoning, or I'm sorry, the, the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals uh, is to hear and decide appeals of decisions from the Community Development Director. Typically, those involved garages, sheds that violate side setback lines, rear setback lines, or may actually encroach on an adjoining property. The Zoning Board of Appeals, and now the Planning and Zoning Commission on those decisions, acts as an, a, not a recommending body to the city, but they act as an administrative body. As such, a person aggrieved by a decision of the Zoning Board of Appeals, or now the Planning and Zoning Commission in that capacity, um, uh, they went to appeal that, they have to go to the Circuit Court of Cook County and they've got 35 days to do that. Uh, that's governed by the Administrative Review Act. The Planning and Zoning Commission, on the other hand, um, formerly, or now combined with the Plan Commission, conducts public hearings, hears evidence, and from that evidence makes recommendations and findings to the City Council relative to approval of plats of subdivision, plan developments, rezoning, special uses, variances, and amendments to the zoning code itself. Um, but again, they are an advisory uh, uh, recommending body to the city council, and the city council ultimately makes that decision. As finance director uh, Gallagher indicated earlier, the city is in the process of, uh, of re redoing its entire zoning code to make it more modern and, and, and bring it up to date, which I think is something that's going to benefit the city and, and really needs to be done. The other thing I want to talk to you about are boards and commissions. The city council establishes different boards and commissions. Uh, the environmental committee, the economic development committee, whatever. They've got several of them. <clears throat> the city council to establish that passes ordinances to first of all create those committees and commissions. And within those, that ordinance indicates how many members will comprise that committee, their, their term, tenure, appointment, and what their powers, duties, and functions are. Um, so those, those are all codified in, uh, in the ordinances. The last thing I wanted to mention was um, discussions with potential vendors, material suppliers, contractors, and the like. We're a city manager form of government, and so if you've got an idea that is going to benefit the city um, and, and, and you've got some contact or person or whatever um, that, that you would like to talk with that about or pursue that with, the thing to do is actually turn it over to the city manager uh, and not undertake to do that by yourselves. Um, like I said, we are a managerial form of government. It should go to the city manager. From there, it would go to maybe a committee of the whole meeting or then it would be an ordinance or a resolution that would actually uh, be on the agenda for, for council action. So um, that's all I have for tonight. Um, and it's very, quicker. It's very much quicker. And uh, as, as, as uh, City Manager Crumstock indicated, you know, the open meetings act certifications, if, I know Alderman Snoik has already done that, but um, there are other certificates that Mr. Crumstock is still looking for. So. If you could do that, I'm sure it'd be much appreciated. Thank you. Any questions, comments, concerns? Seeing none, moving on. Um, actually, the elections three or more than primary discussion I am striking from this evening's meeting. 
Uh, after reading this, when it came out on Friday, I noticed it was absent of any samples or examples of nearby communities that are also council management forms of government, um, not strong council forms of government. So I would like to see a little bit more information or feedback, some data, some statistics, so we can have uh, data-driven decisions made from this. Um, in, in addition to that, this is a conversation that our aldermen should be having with residents after this conversation happens around this table. So for now, we're going to omit this and move on. It can come back when it has more information brought up, and at that point, we will visit it. Mr. Mayor, I think I have an objection with that. And I'd like to call for the orders of the day. What is your objection? And we're not going to call for any orders of the day. I'll have you I, your objection. I have an objection with you pulling it, and I'm calling for the orders of the day. A call for the orders of the day means we move ahead with this. You yeah. can check it in your parliamentary and Robert's Rules of Order. You can call for the rules of the day, the order for the day. You can call whatever you want, but there is nothing in this there, report. This is not up sentences. for dis this is not up for discussion. Jim, yeah. make a motion for the order of the day. Make a motion for the order of the day. I could be a second and. From there. I mean, it's a, it's a motion for an order of the day. That's a to be to be honest with you, it's a little it's a little new to me. Um, so, um, if, the, if the council wants to consider it, then I guess it's up to a, a second and a vote um, on an order of the day. But again, I'm not uh, as familiar with it as Alderman Diaz is. So, Alderman, do I have a second. Sorry, oh, Alderman Diaz, can you explain that motion a little bit more, please? Sure, an order, call for the order of the day is, uh, prohibits uh, um, an item being pulled from the agenda. It does not, requ it does not require uh, a second. Uh, it does not require um, a vote. You can vote on it, and um, it would take a supermajority to strike it. So do I have a second? Yeah. Why are you looking at me? No, because I knew you would second it. Um, well, I guess, you know, can, I, can we have a discussion on it? Well, first we vote. need to go ahead and make okay. a vote if that's okay. the case. Sure. All those who want to proceed, show of hands. I would, I would like some additional information myself. I'm, I'm with you, Mr. Gell, but I'm learning myself too, and so I would just like some additional information, which I think could be done through discussion. But I'm, I'm, learn, I'm learning myself, so that's why I'm open to a discussion tonight. It seems like Mr. Diastas might have some of the background on it, which I know is not in the write-up. Okay, so here, I, as I chairman of the board, as chairman of this council at this point, if you look at every other agenda item that was presented in our packet, there was numerous points and positions with data and statistics driving them so we could review them in advance. Okay. I'm not saying this is not up for discussion at some point. Three sentences does not constitute a cogent opportunity to discuss this at this time. So my question is, who's in favor of continuing this conversation at this point? A show of hands. Um, Mr. Mayor, can I add one thing? I think the, the one thing I'm thinking right now is to at least give, um, I agree with you, regarding there's not much information. Then what I want you to do is but give me with a quick show of hands if you want to see this proceed at this time. Show of hands. Give Mr. Diaz a little mm -hmm. more information on what we're looking for. I, that's exactly what I did. I said I need to know which communities in the area have done this that are also council management form of government. What sort of ramifications are involved? What implications happen for the community? Right? What impacts? Thank you, pardon? And so at this point, we're at a vote to see if we should continue this conversation. Those in favor of continuing the conversation? I, I, I personally don't. I would like more detail, but I don't see there's an issue with continuing with just open discussion. But I, I am with you if we were to move forward. What are we discussing if we don't have any data, statistics, or facts behind this at this time? 
What are we discussing? The fact that a call for the orders of the day, a call for the orders of the day in parliamentary procedure is a motion to require deliberate assembly to conform to its agenda or order of business. Mm -hmm. It does not require a second. It does not call for discussion at this point in time. We've already had a second. We now move to discussion of the item. The question is there has to be a vote in order to approve moving forward. You can have a vote. And we, that's where we're at right now at this time. So show call, hands. call for a vote. That, this is the third time I've called for a vote to and show hands. And you people raise proceeding. hands. Show your hands. I'm comfortable for the discussion. OK. Alder Mendes, take the floor and give your presentation. Thank you. Um, after the last election that the city had, uh, several residents came to me and asked me um, whether or not there would be a runoff in, in, in those uh, elections where the winner did not receive uh, a majority of the voting public. Um, and I said I didn't know the answer. So I looked it up and found out that our city did not have an ordinance that requires um, a majority uh, of the voters. Um, so uh, after talking to several residents, I thought we could have a discussion here of whether or not the city uh, would like to allow the residents the opportunity to speak up on the matter uh, by form of a referendum. A referendum, we would decide what the question would be and then the voters uh, in the March election could decide whether or not we should continue the way we operate now or whether we should change our government to say the winner of any particular elected position should receive 50% or more of the vote. So I appreciate your position on this and I appreciate you fielding questions from residents. And we are, much like many community in the United States, uh, plurality, majority, winner take all form. And with that, we don't. So you don't. We don't continue our pursuit runoffs. And if you would have brought back to me at this time um, information or statistics after voter turnout from a runoff election, because we've only had 2,800 residents participate in our elections. If you wanted to come back to me or to this council and say that after the initial election occurs and a runoff election then takes place, you have a 70% um, attendance rate, then that's significant. But at this time, we could do simple numbers and assume that those who voted for, in this case, the third and fourth place, you take them out of the equation, and that leaves the first and second place voters, which is 1,002 and another 709, and that's a total of 1,711 votes. Voters. And if you wanted to look at that first place recipient of 1,002 votes, that's 59% of the vote, and the second place is 41%. Because you don't have any statistics telling me how many voters are going to come back and participate in a runoff, I don't know whether it's worth our voter turnout time. May I speak, Mr. Mayor? You may speak. Um, in, in, in in the situation we have now, in the situation we're, we're talking about, there is not a voter runoff. It's, it would be similar to the city of Chicago. It would be similar to Hoffman Estates. If there are three or more candidates running for any, pos any elected position, and I'm talking about any position, uh, you're speaking in specifics of one, mm -hmm. I'm not, that there would be a primary uh, when the primary is held, and that the two top vote getters at that point in time would be move on to the election. There is no runoff. We don't do that in this state. And further to that point, it's just a matter of I'm offering this as a, as a potential referendum to let the people of the city decide. Mm. Do they want to continue the way we are going now, or whether they would prefer to do it in a manner that they know whoever wins 
will receive 50% or more of the vote. Can you help has, the people of this city? Excuse me. Can you help uh, the people of this city? Excuse me, I haven't given up the floor yet, sir. Then finish your point. I haven't given point. up the floor yet, sir. Finish your point. Thank you. So, um, with as many people that had come to me and asked me about this, I felt that a referendum, that this, this council should be able to have a discussion on whether or not the people of the, the city could have a referendum and they could make a decision. I don't feel that it's appropriate for seven people at this point in time uh, to make a decision for uh, potentially uh, 15,000 voters, even if only two or 3,000 come out to vote. That's their choice. So um, I've always been about choice, and I feel that uh, it has nothing to do with who won this time. It's a matter of what should we allow the people to do? What do they want to do? And that's why we would offer them a referendum. And seeing as that there is another referendum already on the ballot, it costs the city no additional funds to do it because there's one out there. Do you yield the floor? Yes, at this point I do. Okay, so what I would like to do, and I never said that this could not be brought up for debate and discussion among the seven peers on the council, what it is is bring back for those residents, one, I'd like to now see a petition of all those residents. That would be greatly appreciated. And two, I want to know what the financial implications are to the city to host a primary election thereafter if we have two or more candidates in an election. So I would like to have that data here before we go ahead pursuing this and putting up for a referendum. Um, I said there would be no cost since there is already uh, already uh, um, going um, forward uh, with the with the primary there is vote. no cost since there is already a, a referendum item on the primary ballot for the city you, for you're missing for, the point sir the not no, about not. putting an additional no. referendum on but about the, hosting additional votes right. with additional polling places and the logistics behind those secondary votes that take place right. not about putting a referendum on a ballot for a resident to sign uh, maybe i'm not making myself clear we have a primary in march of 2020 there already is a referendum on that ballot. To add a second referendum on the ballot would not cost additional funds to the city. Mr. Matt, that was the, one of the questions I was going to have for during discussion is going forward, the cost of primary. Can, should, should this pass? Yeah. Yeah. Can I just clarify because um, Alderman Diastas, you're correct. For the referendum, there is no additional cost. True. That is correct. What Mayor Gallo is saying, and I'm not trying to put words in it, but what he's saying is after hypothetically referendum passes and then an ordinance is passed, that first time that a primary comes up, what is the financial considerations to the city, if I'm summarizing it? So it's two different subjects. Yes, okay. and there will be, and then I want presented to the residents so they're fully aware of the long-term ramifications. These are the information that I was expecting to see this evening so we could have a cogent discussion about this. Then I would ask staff to let me know what that cost would be. Because I... All I, the is you brought this to the floor. It would be expected of you to go ahead and do the research. You know, why do you continue to uh, interrupt me when I have the floor? I, I'm being very polite with you. Okay. I'm just asking if staff can get that information for us. And I don't believe that uh, any petition is required. We don't have a petition. We didn't have a petition required to see whether or not we should change the alderman uh, terms. So let's be fair about the whole thing. One, the what we do for one, we do for the other. Fair is fair, and this is this is how government works. It doesn't work by petition. Because whether I brought up. 50 people on a petition or 150, uh, there'd be some kind of comment. So we didn't need a petition to put uh, the terms of office on that. And I would ask staff if they could find out what cost might be for running uh, for running that. Staff, are you okay with resourcing that information? Yes, and I have it with my additional notes too. But right now, it's only finances that I'm looking at. Okay. Any additional feedback or comments for this? No, that was just my question for the discussion was the cost for a long term if it were to be passed. Okay. That was, that was it. And that's a, that's, yeah, a that's why, that's why that I just wanted my, to discuss. That was my first question was, was that um, 
uh, the rest of it, I would just have to wait and see um, when we do bring this to the floor for an actual vote. Uh, things like, um, I mean, I, I, I don't I don't see that, you know, outside of the election that we just had with particularly the mayor's race um, where we had four candidates. Uh, where this has ever been an issue in the past, uh, I'm not sure. I don't know that we can actually foresee that it's going to be an issue in the future. Uh, you know, in some form, it might be a good idea, but like you said, specifics. Um, I'd have to see the specific. You know what we're voting on and you know with the data behind it to make an educated decision so would everybody agree or i'll put it to a vote to agree that this is not ready to be a city council conversation rather a second round of committee of the whole conversation with further data and statistics would, can we vote on I that vote. Yes. Okay. Aye. so a show of hands that's, sure. that's yep. unanimous so we'll stay to the committee of the whole so we can have a cogent discussion moving forward before we bring it to the council Moving on, Manager Crumstock, after your notes, I guess we'll go ahead and move on to open land and empty office building incentives. Thank you, um, Berkman. Um, obviously, this is a, an item that the Economic Development Committee worked on for numerous meetings. Um, it was brought up actually um, a few times, but the gist of it, and just to give you a quick summary, is that um, currently, the City of Rolling Meadows has a real estate transfer tax. It's $3 per thousand. Um, after some discussion, if it was going to be buyer, seller, owner, all the other pieces, the Economic Development Committee actually came back um, with this rebate would be $2 to the buyer of the property, and the city would still keep a dollar. Now, what's not in the write-up is a little bit more of the discussions that we had where it's just not you're the buyer, you get your $2 back very quickly. There has to be development on the project or the vacant um, part. So there's two parts on this. They wanted within six months either a building permit applied for for an open land or um, if it was vacant within nine months to a year, they wanted the property to be, if it was vacant by 25%, they wanted it up to about 75%. So. The committee worked on this for a little bit. Um, they felt comfortable bringing it back now to the city council to see if you're even up to that point in time where you think that we should even entertain a real estate transfer tax incentive. And again, it deals with open land. We don't have a lot of open land, other than the city has some open land. But there are some empty office buildings. Would this incentive get some of those that are 25% or more vacant moving up. We're not looking at those that are 50, 75 percent. We're really looking for those big ones that just have not moved. So the parameters that we came up with was two dollars to the buyer, one dollar that the city, six months, nine months, and a year are part of those thresholds that they have. But at the same point in time, without bringing more out, we just want to make sure that um, obviously staff was moving the right way before we even start developing or ordinance or resolution on this to actually have that discussion. <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Mr. Crimson, would it be, I know you, that was additional information was helpful, the six months, nine months, would that be tiered? Because I believe the transfer takes place at the point of purchase, so would, would it go into an escrow and then it'd be tiered to how they're doing it six months, nine months, 12? Because that was my worry too, is we give away two thirds and then they don't do anything with it. So the feeling was, um, that's why they made the parameter within the six months to a year um, that the building permit, because okay. then we would already have a building permit that they paid for and that they're doing. The fear of the Economic Development Committee was, um, and this is not paid in an escrow. Okay. This is one year, 2019, we are taking in the real estate transfer tax, 2020 or 2021, depending on when that actually happened, but 2020 would be when it would be paid. Okay. So reserves are being used coming mm -hmm. and going with that piece. It's not a lot of dollar amounts. Right. We did some calculations when we were doing that, but it might get the incentive of all the uh, other pieces that are going on. Part of it is also um, 
the Economic Development Committee did not want something just being purchased by a friend and then you have another friend purchasing it and then nothing's really being done. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's little amount, but it might get someone to look at it. The biggest thing that the committee really talked about was if you have something that's um, 50 to 75 percent vacant, how do you address getting that last piece done? And maybe this incentive that a person has come in for the building permit to actually do the work. And then there was some discussion about, okay, once you have the building permit, how long should it take? That's where some of those thresholds come okay. up. But it is not a tier. You hit that threshold, that's when it's going out. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> All yeah. yeah, my my one concern is ex kind of what it sounds like they're uh, the committee is trying to address, and that's really that someone doesn't uh, you know pull a permit and then say, oh well, you know what, it stays it stays vacant, or um, we decided that we're not going to build this. You know, after they've pulled the permit, we've already given them two thirds back mm -hmm. on the thing. Yeah, no. So, Mr. Davis, <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. All the media has. Thank you. Um, no, the, the the economic development committee had had in depth conversations about this, and uh, we had a write up on it uh, that said um, it, we outlined the committee outlined um, how this worked. They defined what open land was. Um, they defined what uh, an empty office building was and and even put a time frame on how long a building has to be empty before it qualifies yeah. so oh that goodness. was all that was all done in it was all written into it and and uh, maybe mr. Kremps could send that information out to everybody and it wasn't until progress was made so um, they couldn't just pull a permit like you had uh, mm -hmm. implied and then uh, get their uh, however much money the incentive would be. There had to be a little bit more than that going on. And, and the same for the open land. They'd have to, they had to buy it and then they had to do something with it. It wasn't just, oh, I'm going to buy this piece of vacant land and then get my money. Something had to happen. Mm -hmm. And the same with empty office building. Something had to happen before they would get anything. So. Uh, the, the entire committee uh, really put some <coughs> relatively stringent um, fences on this, and uh, it, it should be noted that you know we, the committee, uh, recommended this to, to the council, but I think the council should see what the, the fencing was so that you have a much better idea. I thought there would be something attached to her, and there wasn't. Um, but uh, you know, maybe we could you could send that out to everybody, and we could have this at another council meeting in the future. But it's the whole idea of the economic development committee was here is another tool that the city can use to try to attract businesses to the city, either a to purchase vacant land that we have, whether it's the city has it or it's just vacant land, or to try to help. Uh, uh, fill these empty office buildings that we have. So it's just another tool, another arrow in the quiver of the city to try to develop more economic development. Alderman McKinnon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I compliment the Economic Development Committee for looking into issues like this. Um, just the example we're using right there, I can't believe a buyer would buy or not buy a building over $11,000. That's just an opinion. And I, I might be wrong, but I think we, especially on the larger properties, I don't. I think this would be a non-starter in the sense whether it would make the decision for, pro or con one or the other. Again, it's just my opinion, but I, I, again, I compliment you for trying to get something that makes an incentive out there. I just don't see this as being a game changer. And again, in my opinion, thank you. Additional one question. Thing. I was wondering, would this this is also going to apply to? This would only apply to office buildings or vacant land, mm -hmm. right? Wouldn't have anything to do with homes no, or nope, anything no. like that. Okay, it's all commercial. Just want to make sure. And, and if the council wanted to uh, increase that, I mean, we wanted a, a starting point and 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 some sort of incentive to present. Um, the council could, you know, use its discretion and and come up with something else. We just saw. 
transfer tax money coming in. It wasn't, uh, we weren't charging residents, uh, so we weren't taking any tax dollars uh, that somebody may contribute. Mm -hmm. It was kind of, it was... Free money for like Well, I, I don't want to say that. <laughs> right, it's it's right. free money. But it wasn't going to um, um, take my tax dollars right. and, and pay somebody. Right. And, and that's what we tried to avoid. But council could, at its discretion, increase that however they'd like. Mr. Mayor? Yes, all the uh, one, one last thing. You know, I'm going to play my new card now. Uh, I think we only got one per meeting. One okay. per meeting? Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, currently, the when we get the transfer tax, where does that, I mean, is that money currently earmarked for something? It goes into the general fund. Just into the general fund for... Yep. It's paying for all different things in the general fund. Things so. like the $400,000 that we just talked about going... Police, fire, so general government, sitting done. here, community events, anything that's in that general fund, it's just allocated throughout that entire point. Okay. And it's... it's a, I'm not sure how much we typically get in... Uh, transfer. Tax. Transfer. Um... On the top of my head, um, <laughs> here you got your su your supports up here. I'm just trying to, just, trying to see just, what type of impact there might be. If just we generally, I, I can tell you, we we budgeted three hundred thousand, but last year we received nine hundred twenty-one thousand. So it just depends on the year. We, it's not a predictor that you can really. We're not talking a lot no. of um, numbers. numbers, except if so. Go back into the wayback machine, and this is why I was trying to figure out <laughs> in the top of my head when you have a large piece of property when Gallagher. Um, purchase that. That's a large transfer tax, and that's why when we do our quarterly reports, where we show you how transfer taxes are, but they're pretty consistent in about that 300 transfer, 150. If we don't have a lot of big transfers, but we're not talking a lot about big money. The economic development committee acknowledged that mm -hmm. as they were going between all the different pieces between buyer seller. Do you give it to the agent because they thought maybe it should be an agent incentive? And they said, no, we're not giving it to agents. So you are correct. It's little amounts. It's just how do you do the pieces? And that's why we're bringing it up here because if we're going to spend more time from the economic development, the resolution or ordinance is going to be a little more detailed and takes a little more time putting in some of the nuances that we talked about as a committee. Okay. Did you tell Alderman Bassessi that it's no more cards tied? <laughs> I use my one for the meeting. <laughs> um, it's a small amount of money, but perhaps, uh, and this might be a question for the Economic Development Committee at a later time, uh, perhaps when we go out to bid, uh, or if we have any uh, examples where commercial businesses are coming in, uh, if we have some sort of um, agreement going forward, if they want to build or construct that would impact the community or have some kind of community agreement going forward, that might, um, uh, to Alderman Bassessi's point, uh, balance out maybe that 11000 or so that might have gone to something else, like public works, then that, that, might, be, um, that might be a viable solution. Okay. Any further questions or comments on this subject? No, it's okay. just, again, um, I think what we're hearing is that you want some additional information, um, so don't take a straw vote tonight, and we'll get more stuff in there, and then we'll start doing it. But we were just bringing it in to, because this ordinance resolution is going to take a lot more time to craft. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, the Economic Development Committee, we were doing concepts, um, discussions, and we have to do some refinements. Okay. So let's move on to the electronic participation by city council members. Alderman O'Brien. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this was actually came up a couple, actually, a uh, column meeting ago when uh, Attorney McCall did the overall initial training and we were, there was talk of the Open Meeting Act. Is there was a little bit of follow-up on that um, that I had done in talking to some others about the Open Meetings Act, which a part of it more recently done was that elected officials can attend. It was a state statute that was passed, and apologies, Mr. McCall, if I used the wrong word, statute versus uh, the other ones, is it was part of the Illinois state law that was passed several years ago when technology wasn't the greatest, it was probably the rotary phone type thing, is that members of bodies 
can attend remotely if they meet one of three special circumstances. Because I think everybody's expectation here is for our residents and those of us in the cities that our expectation is to be here physically. But we also all do have other work commitments, not necessarily for city events, because this is our priority on Tuesday evenings along with city events, but there is a time when some of us may be missing a meeting, as I was talking to Mr. Bud Metz um, at last meeting when the agenda came out, that he would be missing this evening. So I just wanted to put in front of the group is I took a very, very rough draft using an old ordinance, so I had all the criteria in there, is it really does, the state calls out, it's only for one of three exceptions. It's either a personal illness or disability, employment purposes, or family or other emergency. It's clearly not for vacation. When we're vacation with our family, we can't call in, we're just absent for that meeting. And then I did put through um, 14 other requirements. I don't want to read through them one by one, but calling out that expectation is that we all are here. A core must still be physically present in the room. Only two of us could be missing at the time, so a quorum still here. Those two people couldn't be at the same remote location for a call. So I did really use, I had a hard time looking at the ordinances, the municipal ordinances for Arlington, Hoffman, Schomburg, Palatine, our surrounding ones. The ones that I reviewed happened to be from the western suburbs area, Oak Park, River Forest. That Those seemed to be most accessible through searches, so I did pick and choose some some of those. So it really was just to get a straw poll of thought, people, and some of the questions I'm struggling with as I was drafting this, would it just be for city council? Or is it for any council? And that was some of the wording as this would continue. Would it be effective for planning and zoning? Would it be, or is it just elected? The way that some of them I reviewed, it clearly called on their ordinance elected officials only, where the other ones are appointed. So I just wanted to bring to the group for discussion, since it's a new council, technologies advanced, some of the other questions is what would it cost? I don't know if the room is set for a phone call. I don't think we would need to do video, but that was some of the additional thing that it might be cost prohibitive as well. That was just what I wanted to, to chat with the group about since it was a new council and technology had advanced and our initial training kind of spurred my thought to it. Comments? Questions? Does staff want to or does city council want to move forward on this item and explore it and investigate opportunities and options? Staff, do you need time to look into this yeah. with AV? So, yeah, if the council decides that they would like to move on, that's what we would need, the IT and IEV time, so we can get you some additional. Mm -hmm. Obviously, talking to Alderman O'Brien, um, that was one thing that we did mention, because, mm -hmm. again, um, this room, when it was being set up, was not for that. Mm -hmm. this, this discussion has come up in the past, and the council at that point in time mm -hmm. specifically stated they wanted the presence. Um, and again, mm -hmm. technology just does um, change. It's Alderman O'Brien and I talked about as long as we're making this so refined and everything else, and you know, people understand what the parameters are, you know, that's part of what is going on but the council needs to give us that direction if you want us to spend the time to see what we would bring and what we would bring in is what Alderman O'Brien said is only telephonic. We would not be doing video at this point. The law sure. allows for video, but I don't think we would need to go to that expense. And I guess one of my, my questions or concerns would be that you know, is this going to be a, a, a chronic issue where council members are going to fall in one of these three buckets and it's it's going to be a necessity? Or is it something, if, if there is a significant issue up on the agenda at that time, could we, in a show of collaboration and camaraderie, just table it till the next meeting if it was that and, significant? And that's right. No, really I'm not expecting it to be. And that's even some of the criteria I put in there is a doctor's note, or if it is for an employment thing that the state law does, that hey, you have to turn in your travel itinerary. To yours, you have to give notification to the, yourself as the mayor or the city manager, both of them, and they could request additional documentation. So no, I wouldn't expect it to be a chronic thing by any means. It was just something that, yeah. But then the, 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 the point too on the, the chronic issue, if it's not a chronic issue among council members, and there happens to be a controversial or contentious or significant item on the agenda, we can always make a, a motion first and second to postpone or table to the next meeting and if we needed additional But I'm, I'm open to this if it would become back cost prohibitive. Absolutely. I mean, I'd like to at least maybe see what the cost, but I, I'm absolutely with you, and I think the camaraderie we could postpone if it would be cost prohibitive. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be on board for that. Okay. So the question becomes, do, does council want staff to pursue looking into this matter? I ask one other yeah, question. Go for it. Uh, Mr. Mayor, would it be possible that you could run a meeting from uh, away from here in your position? I'm just asking this question. I don't know if it's doable or not. 
paralleling it to other meetings and other conferences, yes. Okay. And I was going to say that's that's too. Also, is again, we could strike and delete and tweak. That was something as if the Mr. Mayor wasn't going to be here, or future mayor, there would have to be another presiding body in the room. I I think that the the challenge becomes making sure that those other participants are verbal enough to Absolutely. illustrate what's occurring at the time. Agree. Right. I mean, Agreed. that's the challenge. I agree. I have a question for staff as well. If we're going to look into the cost of allowing a council member to be able to remotely participate in the meetings, would it be uh, difficult for staff to also consider how we could incorporate citizens to also participate remotely? That's a, that's a great that's point. Fair. That's um, a great point. To your point also, Alderman Cannon, I think hopefully as, as mayor, I would just allow the mayor pro tem to sit in, okay, in my fair. absence, but fair. it could be done. Anything further from council? If not, quick show of hands to see if we should continue exploring and pursuing this with staff and AV. All in favor? It's unanimous. You have it. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, Manager Crumstock, G1 hours of operation. Well, I was sort of close to what I said, but um, it is close to 9.30. However, um, as aldermen have known um, for almost a year now, we have had a G1 license. Um, we have five locations that are up and running for video gaming. The sixth one will be up and running real soon. Um, that would be Isabel's on uh, New Wilkie. But during this point in time when all five have been open, we've been hearing as staff, and I know that certain aldermen have heard this too, is that our weekday hours of operations for the video gaming starting at 11 o'clock makes it a competitive disadvantage for those businesses. So to give a really quick summary, majority of the businesses who have reached out to staff and have talked to staff is they would prefer an 8 o'clock start. There is one that does want a 7 o'clock start. Um, as you know and staff, our recommendation would really be the 8 o'clock start. Um, obviously with discussions with the mayor when we had this, Mayor Gill, I'm going to put words in your mouth. Um, if the council decides that you want to do this, one thing that would not be in the ordinance, but each of the organizations would have to give us the data, what does 8 o'clock to 11 o'clock do? The city cannot get that information, obviously, from the state. However, all the vendors, all those machines, when they're active, they're getting that information. Mm -hmm. So we can get that information to see what does 8 o'clock to 11 actually do. I'm only using 8 o'clock if council members want to do a different time. I'm, you know, obviously just making the recommendation that we heard. So the discussion that um, we really want to have with council and the direction that we're looking for is just for the G1 hours, because it deals with the video gaming machines, um, would be the reduction from 11 a.m. start time to, again, the recommendation would be 8 um, for weekdays. So again, striking 11, putting 8 in each of those pieces, so allowing the G1 operators to actually activate those machines earlier. Hold on, do you ask this? Thank you. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, my first question is, um, you said it would put them at a competitive disadvantage. I'm assuming you're speaking to other uh, gaming establishments in the area. That is correct. Okay. Uh, my second question is, since all of our G1 license holders are essentially uh, restaurants, Mm -hmm. with gaming, um, they would have to then start selling food at 8 o'clock as well. So the answer is yes, and majority of them do open up before the 11 o'clock uh, start time right now, and that's where this is really coming in because many of their customers are there for the meal and then they would like to go I'm, to the video I just want to verify food, that, right. yes. that they're going to be serving food because yes. Uh, the, the intention of the G1 was to have more restaurants come into the city, and this was a tool, another tool, 
so that they could supplement some income um, and create income for the city as well. So two out of the five would have to change their start time. The other three are already opening. Okay, and they all serve food, but that they is still correct. don't serve alcohol until. If you change the G1, they would we would be able to start serving alcohol at 8 o'clock in the morning. We would ask that you would start, that the liquor would start at the same time as the video gaming machines. Okay. Now, you can make that decision and say, because remember, to get a G1, they need the A1, A2, D, all those pieces. You right. can make in it that the only thing that you are changing is the operations, because G1 is only dealing with that. But what we're trying to get to is what we've heard is that they're more concerned about the gaming machines. But I guess that what you're also trying well, to say is it might be easier well, just to open everything. I'm concerned that it's not just the gaming machines, that because they are restaurants, they start serving restaurant food at 8 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I'm, typically that would be some kind of a breakfast food, uh, breakfast sandwich, scrambled eggs, whatever the case may be. Um, uh, you know, because they all have you know grills and whatnot, um, so they would start serving breakfast food at eight o'clock in the morning. And they could do the blood meter. Sure, they could do a bloody mary and put some uh, some celery and some whatever in there, some shrimps and what have you. Um, that would be fine. I mean, but I just want to make sure I understand. G1 gaming, food, and alcohol all starting at eight o'clock. If that's what the council has okay. decided to make, we were only talking about the video gaming machines going active early. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I personally would not go for just the gaming machines right. active at 8 o'clock. There has to be food to go along with that because, again, these are restaurants that have video gaming. This is not mm -hmm. video gaming that maybe has a sandwich, the, uh, you know, a cold salami sandwich or something like that. That's correct. Yeah. Again, I think the, the primary conversation of this was that the restaurants that are open at this time would just like to turn their machines on at that same time. That is correct. Okay. And again, we can get that information for them, and it's been confirmed. Mm -hmm. so. And because the restaurants are open, their menus are available to patrons. Yep. Alderman Cannon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just out of curiosity, do any of the current holders of this license serve breakfast right now? Uh, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. uh, Daisy's Cafe yep. um, is actually one of the newer ones that actually Isabella's that will be opening up and as Red Apple in Rolling Meadows. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the three that actually have hours that are earlier than the 8 o'clock start. Um, the two that do not have stadium obviously is a little bit later. Um, but he is talking to us about another location that he would probably change his hours. And um, Grundy Jake's is also opened a little bit later, but if his hours um, changed, he might do something a little bit different. But he was not really um, open at 8 o'clock at this point in time. His start is 10 or 11. I think it's 11 o'clock on his weekdays. Okay, thanks for the answer. Any further comments? Just, and that would confirm to uh, Mr. Comstock is that it, that would just mirror the weekend hours, starting at 8 a.m. with the proposals we're looking that's at. That's our proposal. Right. Okay. So that's the proposal you've drafted. Is it would just mirror Saturday and Sunday? Yeah. The one group that really wanted the seven o'clock, he would like it at five o'clock, and I'm not really interested in that. And Agreed. that's just a personal uh, mm -hmm. comment, and usually don't give you that personal comment. So. <laughs> So with that, would you like a quick show of hands for direction? I, I think it's now two questions. So if the direction is that can we change the start time to the G1, mm -hmm. if you prefer 8 o'clock, is which is staff's recommendation, if someone else wants to do it. And then I guess that the next part would be, um, do you want the G1 specifically stating alcohol too? We did not really address that one. Okay. So it's two parts. And right. breakfast. Or food. Food. Food okay. and that liquor starting all at the same okay. time as the machines. All right, so a quick show of hands for the first one to allow the machines to turn on at 8 a.m. Those in favor? Okay, and the second question being the one about serving alcohol and food at that same time if they don't already. Yeah. Show of hands in favor? Those opposed? Okay, still majority moves it forward. Okay. No. Well, that brings us to the end of this wonderful agenda. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Alderman O'Brien. All those in favor? Aye. 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 As opposed? Ayes have it. Have a good evening. Thank you. Where's that?